Aloha and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 8th of November 2021. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman and this week we would like to issue a joint statement on the uh, ambitious targets we are setting for Watching Brief and its, its carbon footprint. Uh, we are going to aim to reduce the length of Watching Brief to 15 minutes per show by 2050. Uh, this is a fairly ambitious target, but nonetheless one that we can meet if we start work immediately on this goal, which may see in the short term watching brief actually increase in its average length. But as we develop new technologies and as we become more and more efficient in our approach to to uh, our, uh, our, our ongoing mission, then hopefully by 2050, 15 minutes per episode is an achievable goal. I think this is uh, this is. Uh, all, all that we're able to to uh, to commit ourselves to at this stage, but uh, but I feel as though it can be achieved, Andy. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Although I, I ought to point out that the Australian version of Watching Brief uh, will hope to achieve that same goal by twenty seventy. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. yes. Um, we'll also be um, uh, attempting to hire a Conservative member of Parliament as a consultant. <laughs> uh, we'll be doing that as soon as we've raised enough money. Yes. and track one down in the Caribbean. Yes, and, and it can be anything up to a million pounds, as, as far as we, we can tell, for the going rate. So, uh, actually, with that in mind, we do, in fact, have a Patreon, if you want to help us. Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Don't go there. <laughs> I, look, I'm pretty sure that attempting to bribe a, a Member of Parliament is probably a specific offence under British law, so I think we perhaps ought to steer well clear of that. And... Um, point out in subtitles we're joking we are absolutely joking yeah 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 uh but if you if you are at all aware of what's been happening in this country uh in the past past couple of weeks then uh, you, that that will make some sense to you but uh, yes we we would appreciate your support on patreon but don't worry we're absolutely not going to use your money if you do want to support our work here to attempt to bribe or hire or consult with anyone in fact um and uh, especially members of the uk parliament um ha however i would I point out uh, as a as a special tribute to the actions of the uk government in trying to get one of its members off a corruption hook and um by changing the rules um our, our link of the week is a sort of tribute to that kind of politics really um, or, the, or the people who undertake that kind of politics. Um, we've linked to an image of perhaps one of my favourite historic objects ever. Um, it's the shaming pillar of the Danish politician and traitor Kurfitz Uffelt, who was active in the 17th century. Um, he got involved in uh, a plot to overthrow the Danish state, effectively, um, and was run out of Copenhagen. Um, but unfortunately, um, but, but, well, fortunately for him, before he could be executed for treason. Um, so to get their own back, the Danes uh, hanged an effigy of him and also erected what they call the shaming pillar, the which shaming is now in the National pillar. Museum at Copenhagen, a shaming pillar. Um, it, uh, and, and it has an inscription which is uh, in translation, to the eternal mockery, shame and disgrace of Corfitz Uffelt. Um uh, we just thought that um, that's a tradition, a folk tradition that maybe is ripe for revival, given that what some of our politicians have been up to in the last few years. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and also a nice little bit of history. So don't let you know, don't let anyone complain that we're being we're being too uh, Westminster or political. There, that's that's historical, Andy. This is this is this is an archaeological news uh, podcast. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, we're going to start this this week's watching brief by examining. Uh, the fact that we are amazing and that we were uh, apparently ahead of the curve on uh, on one news story in particular last week. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, the uh, the story with regards to the, shall we say it, problematic um, uh, coverage of the, uh, the AGM at the National Trust and the Restore Trust movement on the radio, uh, BBC Radio 4's Today programme. Not only 
brought uh, was brought to, the, to our attention through people's reaction on Twitter, but also actually made it into, for example, the Byline Times this past week. We'll link to that below. Uh, and that uh, that is 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 starting to raise some questions as to as to well, actually, what they describe here as shameful journalism. I don't think we went quite that far in our in our coverage of this, but you know, yeah. just 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 to highlight that if you want to if you want the tip top sharpest edge of some of this commentary, then uh, watching brief is the place to be. But also as well, Andy, there's a, a development with regards to uh, something that, that we touched on last week, and that is the use of the Historic Environment Records Office data, um, data set and, and uh, publicly available database, um, to target sites of archaeological interest for, for example, metal detecting, isn't there? That's right. Um, to to uh, recapitulate quickly, um, on uh, Friday last week, and we talked about it in Watching Brief as well, uh, we published a story on the pipeline uh, suggesting that a metal detecting rally company, a commercial metal detecting rally company called Sovereign Metal Detecting in mm. Shropshire, um, was uh, had said, in fact, uh, that it was uh, using research to target archaeology for its commercial rallies. And it um, published some quotes, which at least one of them we were able to trace back to the Shropshire Historic Environment Record. That's the the the, the archive that um, basically catalogues all known archaeology in the county, and it's a core tool for the development process, but also for researchers. Mm. Um, it was, but it was never intended to. Um, provide a tool for metal detectors and particularly commercial metal detecting rallies to uh, target archaeology for their uh, for their events yeah. um, we, we wrote up the story um, and um, contacted Shropshire Council and the um, portable antiquities scheme for comment um, after we published the story on the Friday on the Saturday sovereign metal detecting announced that the venue that they had uh, originally announced for their Sunday rally, which was the one that appears to have used HER data, um, they, th that rally venue, had, that venue had been cancelled and they were putting an alternate in place. They didn't explain why. No. Um, and then on Monday, uh, it, uh, I got a reply back from uh, Shropshire Council and the Shropshire Council uh, press office uh, saying that, yes, they were uh, concerned about what uh, appeared to have been going on, and they were, uh, as a result, making the uh, coarsening uh, the um, location data on the publicly available parts of the HER so that it was more difficult to tie records down to a specific location. Right, yeah. Now, obviously, there's a knock-on effect for genuine researchers who don't aren't trying to... Mm -hmm. Um, just go out there and find stuff. Um, but, um, a, 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 and also uh, a number of people are commenting on, on the story said, well, wait a minute, haven't metal detectorists been using HERs and air photographs and all the other tools that archaeologists use to find sites for years? Mm. Um, and the answer to that is yes, it's a known issue. Um, what I think was different about our story was that um, I think it's the first time that we've tied a specific location and a specific company down to using HER data yeah. to promote their rally. Yeah, it's interesting. One of my one of my first roles uh, in in the northeast, when it comes to uh, sort of the, the heritage sector, was working. Uh, well, sorry, was volunteering at the local HER office. Apparently, they didn't at the time often take on volunteers, but you know, I seemed like a, a, a eager, reasonably capable person and. What what was interesting there was that, that that experience really highlighted a couple of things for me. First of all, it highlighted the range of people who come to use HER records, and it it is a range. Some of it will be commercial archaeologists, uh, some of it will be um, academics, some of it will be uh, interested members of the public, both local and from further afield, who are looking into certain records or plots of land or questions that they that they maybe have identified on the web portal and want to come in and actually check maybe some physical records if they're available so so that in so access is a key aspect of of the hr or certainly again was back when i was volunteering for them was a key aspect of, of the database and, and and local or regional rather offices but also um th th there's a strange tension that uh that i ex i was in the, right in the middle of during my time uh, volunteering, 
whereby I was, uh, you know, what one of the big projects that I was asked to to do was to transfer data that had been taken from local records from a diving, um, um, an amateur diving group who had been able to more securely identify the locations of shipwrecks off the coast. So off uh, off the northeast coast in and around Tynemouth and and up and down the coast as far north as Berwick and as far south, I think, as, um, as Middlesbrough. Uh, and that so that that was interesting because it, it meant they were able to to more accurately describe what was there. So there was talk, you know, discussion about whether this was a triple screw engine, this kind of thing, if the ship's bell was present, uh, so on and so forth. But Im- implicit in these in these these non archaeological reports, these were reports of, of hobbyist divers who were looking for interesting places to dive. There was there were descriptions that were built into those that were kind of highlighting objects of value things like ship's bells things like brass um or you know uh, identifiable uh naval um uh artifacts and and memorabilia i suppose especially things things like like name you know uh, ship's name plaques this kind of thing uh and we were uh at the time we were sort of querying as to how we go about recording that in the HER because in that sense the record had to be as full as possible and this information was available on paper elsewhere if someone cared to go looking for it but we were also aware at the time of the fact that, that what we were doing was was kind of showing some low-hanging fruit um, to, <laughs> to people who may want to come and look at it so this has this has always been an issue and and it and and certainly I suppose the reason why I, why I share that anecdote is just to highlight that it's not as though members of staff in the offices haven't been aware of the potential for this sort of abuse mm. but it's interesting that in this instance uh it looks as though you've all but all but absolutely confirmed that 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 this is likely to have been the case with this group do do, do we know what actually put them is likely to have put them off potentially uh going ahead i mean w- were they contacted by the council perhaps um that's possible i'm still trying to find out what right. what exactly happened but mm. um Certainly, um, it was all systems go until it wasn't. So something happened that made them pull that venue. Right. Um, I, I, I just make one sort of quick addition to what you've just said, and you're quite right. You know, the, the, the people working in HERs have known about this for some time and, mm. and been concerned about it for some time. Mm. Um, and but the I think like many many other things, the the arrival of you know the medium we're talking on now, the internet, mm. uh, has change things because there is now and, and again a number of people have contacted me since the story came out um expressing concerns about the wholesale in some cases export of her data onto privately operated websites yes um for various interest groups mm. um and we're into a very gray area here because of, of, of things like copyright and so on because um certainly for um, commercial purposes, most HERs, uh, most HERs charge. So if you're a development archaeologist doing a desktop study mm. and you use local HER data, um, you'll be charged for it by the council. And I think that's perfectly fair. It's being done for a commercial purpose. It's helping to support the, the provision of the what is in many places a, a, you know, a diminishing service because it's, it, it, it's expensive. Well, it's, and, it's, uh, and what, was, what, as, what was at the time a very cold back room in a graveyard uh, where we had a kettle and a toilet that occasionally broke. <laughs> so, yeah. There wasn't it, even it, a toaster. It, it, there wasn't even, you know, we couldn't even make make a toasty. Anyway, go on. <laughs> yeah, so, no, exactly. So, you know, that's exactly the point that, you know, there's there's been a lot of concern in the archaeological community for some time about the fact that some councils don't even maintain an HER of those that they're supposed to. No. Um, it's an, at least they're, they're advised to. It's it's not statutory. No. Um and uh, although again there have been campaigns to make it statutory mm. but you know the, it, the the um the idea that this data which is essentially public data um is being used commercially without permission and in potentially in some cases in ways that are you know potentially harmful to the things that actually meant to be there to understand and protect which is this you know the historic environment the historic record mm. uh what's out there in in the landscape um, it is concerning. I suspect um, from the context I've, 
I've had since the story came out. Um, I think there's going to be a follow up, um, and um, all I can say really is, is is watch this space. And if if any of uh, you know anyone watching this has experience of the HER being misused. Mm. And we look, you know, we want to encourage people to use HERs to do proper research that gets published, family research, whatever it is. But but we need to know if HERs are being used to target and potentially damage the historic environment. Yeah. So if anybody has got any information on that, please get in touch. Yeah, no, well, absolutely. I suppose something that, that occurs to me, I, I think uh, I think it might have been um, our... Uh, friend Reese in Australia potentially who commented on last week's video uh, suggesting that one way around this sort of problem is to make it so that people have uh, pay essentially paid membership access so uh, he was talking about how um, mm. if it was him or someone else certainly mentioned how in Australia you have um, uh, uh, you know registered heritage workers people who are who are trained um, cultural asset management types who have a login, and if they want to get data, then we know who who was who was accessing the database, and they have to pay in order to do that. Yeah. The, the, the The problem there is that it it somewhat goes against the spirit of of the HER, and and I don't think we we are yet at a point where we have to recommend or suggest or or, or move towards that sort of gated access or, or lack of access. I suppose one one of the beauties of of of, of the HER is that it is actually open access. Um, for anyone who is interested, um, but did, uh, I suppose the, a, qu a question, though impl implicit in that, is how on earth do we potentially square that circle or circle that square? In so much as we can't, we can't police how people, we can't police intent, can we? I suppose if if we're going to we, allow no, open no, no, access, no, that's absolutely true. And the the point about access and maintaining access was made by Shropshire Council when they responded to. Uh, media request mm. uh, it, it, it is a public record it needs to be uh, it needs to remain accessible to the public you know mm. um, there, there is a kind of, there are precedents for potential ways of dealing with the with, with this kind of issue for example um, the portable antiquities scheme database if you want access to the higher level database um, information including um, the um, the eight figure Ordnance Survey grid references and 12-figure Ordnance Survey grid references, mm. then you have to apply to them for a login and show that you're a bona fide researcher. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you have a you you basically you have different different levels of access. So there's a publicly accessible database which is, which certain uh, information is excluded from, and then the higher level which is uh, it, it, you know is accessed by password and there is control over who actually gets the passwords. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, so there's something there potentially in terms of access. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just that having a, a wholesale ring fence database is not the goal of the of the of the project in that sense. Yeah. No, and, and I think it's worth mentioning as well that one of the government's ambitions that it's announced is to make the uh, development process as online as possible. And in mm. fact, you know, quite a few counties have started to migrate their database, their HERs onto online where they mm. can. Mm. Um, and, and that is a trend that will only increase, I think, mm. uh, uh, you know, where, where HERs are maintained, they will increasingly mm. become digital. Um, yeah. And uh, so the issue, you know, becomes a very live one. Yeah, well, um, sorry, not not to add something else to that as well, but also I guess uh, there's also actually a, a real positive a boon there in terms of transparency. So some mm. something that we mentioned, I think, a couple of watching briefs ago now was the issue whereby some people, especially if if they're interested in the potential value of an artifact that they may have recovered, often there's a suspicion that people at museums and people in uh, archaeologists and others have have vested interest that they're somehow hiding from the public and so again being anything other than than transparent up until the point at which you are putting an object in danger i think would be would would would, would probably make these sorts of interactions even more fraught with potential for for misunderstanding and, yeah. and uh, downright suspicion so yeah okay yeah. okay uh, we'll have to try and find a way forward there um let's get right on that we'll get on that straight away after this watching brief shall we uh, we'll solve that problem. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, though, uh, along with world peace and and, uh, and world hunger, yeah, exactly. oh, and, and the climate and the climate emergency, exactly, exactly, yeah. 
Uh, as part of this segment as well, we've included a, a link to an article below uh, highlighting uh, in the context of the uh, the National Trust the conversation we had last week and also the, the Byline Times coverage of it this week, uh, highlighting uh, it's an opinion piece. It's a it's a it's a an editorial essentially, I suppose, from uh, the perspective that number ten is marching a coach and horses through uh, cultural institutions in Britain. Um, I, I'm not sure that we need, necessarily need to go into that right now here, but it does. That's the reason why we've included that link below. Is it, it sort of expands on something that we were talking about last week, and also, frankly, the general context of um, of, uh, of heritage uh, in this country at the moment. The, the article you're you're referring to is uh, by Charlotte Higgins, um, who looks in detail at the people in the Downing Street operation, who she argues are behind this whole culture war. Um, effort, um, mm. which is also being mirrored by magazines like the uh, or, or newspapers like the Mail and like the Telegraph and the Spectator, um, yeah, Spectator, uh, uh, mm. uh, and, and various people on on, on Twitter as well. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's a developing story. Yeah, well, and it's also it's also as I say, it, it, it's just one of the one of the things that that there is a reality for archaeology and the heritage sector in the UK at the moment. And and that's really underscored by uh, the opening for our second segment for this week's Watching Brief, uh, which I've sort of loosely titled It's Hard Being a Student <laughs> These Days, um, uh, in so much as uh, the, 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 the somewhat hostile, or at the very least suspicious environment that, that surrounds cultural education at the moment in this country that is being encouraged by people with a lot of power uh, is highlighted once more at Sheffield where they are calling for a, a new rally. Uh, Unite Against Cultural Van Vandalism uh, is set to have a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, rally on the 1st of December uh, this year. Ah, oh, I, I have to say, uh, I, I, this, and also in the context of some of the other things we were about to talk about, it can't be easy. It really can't be easy studying uh, to be an archaeologist or or, or a related humanita humanities uh, academic at the moment. Absolutely. Look, I mean, everybody has had an appalling 18 months with COVID. Hmm. It's you know, the, the situation in higher education has been particularly fraught. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had students almost being barricaded and quarantined into accommodation blocks in Manchester. Mm. And, um, and, and, and of course, you know, tutors trying to conjure up um, online courses from from a standing start really because mm -hmm. the tradition has been for you know in-person teaching mm -hmm. in, in, in you know in, and uh, in-person seminars and so on so you know the whole uh, mechanisms of higher education were thrown out of joint and thrown back together again mm. um, added to that there has been what some people argue is a concerted attack on the humanities in general and some archaeology uh, departments in particular, um, Chester came under threat. Fortunately, there haven't been any lost, uh, jobs lost there in the end. But also, you know, uh, Sheffield, we've covered ad nauseum on, uh, uh, on the watching brief. Uh, and also Worcester, more, uh, slightly more recently, where you know, in both cases, the archaeology departments are being closed. Mm. Um, well, in that, in that instance, Worcester uh, said that on Tuesday, the 26th of October, um, that there's been finally, uh, Worcester University finally communicated its decision about the future of archaeology lecturing staff within the Department of Geography, Archaeology and Environment. And it looks as though, well, I don't know, it's not really a reprieve, is it? It's more like a, a, a logical extension uh, to allow teachers to to finish teaching the, 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 the for this academic year that's that's right basically they're allowing the all the current staff to teach out uh, until the end of the current academic year yeah. at which point all the archaeological jobs become redundant yeah. um, in, a, in a sense as you say it's, it's a recognition of a reality of a situation where students were committed to modules and so on until the end of the year yeah. um, and the university would have had to have scrabbled around to find alternative staff to teach those modules out or mm. uh, actually send the students elsewhere mm. um, so it would have been a, you know, an even bigger problem the one they've settled themselves with already mm. um that's it you know but as you say quite rightly um once uh, you know once those jobs 
um, become redundant at the end of uh, in, in, in the early summer. Uh, archaeology at Worcester ends. Yeah. Um, and also the um, uh, Sheffield University has, again, it, um, it, it is in the process of winding up the archaeology department as it currently is, and there is still no sign of what they intend to replace it with. No. Um, no. They, they're still talking about focusing on centres of excellence, mm. um, but uh, there's no, uh, there's actually no real understanding, uh, or, or uh, certainly in public, of what that actually means. Mm. Mm. And, yeah. and and I think the the other thing to to to, to add here to that, that um, yeah we we we, we saw uh, the dangers of conflating issues in Parliament again the other day, but um, there are issues that are conflated here uh, and, and because the the loss of the archaeology department is happening against the background of a much wider and very bitter dispute between the University College Union, uh, which uh, represents many. Uh, university staff including acad and principally academic staff but also others um and the um university governing bodies um mm. which is over well they, they've just he held a strike ballot mm. um over one dispute over the pay and conditions and another dispute over pensions yes yeah. um they're both pretty intractable problems they that uh very, I think, probably tactically quite cleverly, the universe, uh, University College Union has, uh, has, is treating them as separate issues. Mm -hmm. um, and in both cases, the membership has voted uh, both in favour of uh, action short of a strike and action including strike action. Yeah. Um, it's, more, it, it's complicated by the fact that individual branches have to take votes and have to pass a 50 percent threshold mm -hmm. um but pretty much i think pretty much every uh ucu branch has certainly voted in favor of action short of a strike and many of them have endorsed strike action so we are looking at um a potential autumn and winter of um problems um uh, for people who are just going back to in-person teaching and in-person learning. Uh, yeah. I, I was talking to, yeah, I mean, I was talking to a colleague yesterday at one of our major universities in the archaeology department at one of our major universities, and they were telling me that, um, you know, in a sense, nobody wants this. Hmm. Um, it's going to cause yet more problems for staff and for students. At the same time, they feel it has to be done. Well, and... They they feel it has to be done in the context of I've I've lifted uh, from my my alumni's student newspaper here an article highlighting um, Durham University staff vote uh, to strike this term over pensions cut and they highlight, highlight here that the UCU is set to strike in order to protest changes to the university superannuation scheme or USS enterprise this way USS uh, the sectors principal pension benefit system. They argue that the proposals would cut members' annual guaranteed pension by 35% and limit um, protection of the, of, the, of the lump sum from the effects of inflation, presumably devaluing the, the value of anything that has been put into pension pots. Mm. Uh, and... and, and <laughs> Uh, yeah, as you say, and the reason why we're highlighting this is not it's not that it, this, this is part of that difficult time that 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 the, that the archaeology students will be suffering, but rather this is that this is part of an ongoing difficult time that the higher education seemingly is going through. I mean, I think this is from memory. I think this, this might be the third strike in at least four years, maybe. And it feels as though every year at the moment there's some sort of strike action, uh, unfortunately, and and it looks as though whatever solution that that that, that is um uh, that is uh that coalesced from from negotiations tends to just sort of kick a problem slightly further down the road there's uh, i mean it, it, ugh, is this just is this just what it's like to be a student these days i mean in that sense in that sense i think I, what i would say is comment below folks at home you know it, and, it, and and yeah. and academic staff as well yeah. i mean one one of the um one of the issues is career paths yeah um, it, it, you go, you, you go from undergrad. You, are, you you do your masters, then you maybe go on and do your your doctorate, then you try and get a, a, a postdoc. And as a, as a uh, w w when you're doing your PhD and as as a, as a postdoc, you're probably starting to teach. But are you on a contract or are you just on a zero hours contract mm, mm. Um, with very few 
rights and um, you know, and benefits like pensions. Mm, mm. Um, that, 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 or, or for uh, example, the you, ability you, the ability to turn down work which is actually technically outside the remit of your job description. Uh, you know, because because uh, everyone chips mm. in here. This kind of thing, yeah. Mm. Let alone the ability to do things like, for example, aspire to get onto the property ladder and, and or, or or you know start a family or whatever. Mm. You know, the, 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 these are really um, really tough, nutty uh, arguments, uh, problems. And, and I mean, for example, some people argue that the way universities now currently run themselves, there's a there's almost like a, a, a sort of stratification between the staff who've been established for some time and have, uh, have managed to establish pension rights over years mm. um, and new staff joining who have far fewer benefits and far lower wages and, and may not even have guaranteed teaching hours. No. No, yeah. Oh, blimey. Well, uh, it, 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 is, is there any is there any positives this week? I mean, I feel as though I, I'm almost missing this week. Just a good old fashioned here's something cool that's been found <laughs> type of archaeological story. But it did feel as though this 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 was the flavour of the week. Unfortunately, the flavour has been um, has been quite serious. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. It, 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 can, can, can we end on a positive note? Andy? Um, I find it difficult because I know a couple of stories that are coming down the track that we're going to be covering in the next few weeks and months. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay hang on. Hang on just a second. Just a second. I'm going to... Hang on. I, 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 okay. Go. I can find something. I, <laughs> Please, we need it. My goodness, we need it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And we're, we're, we're keeping this in just, just, just to highlight that it, that, it, that it is actually happening live. Just in case people doubt it. Let's see. There must be something positive. Something positive. Let's see. Uh, oh, actually, there is there, there is there is there is there is a sort of positive story today. Okay. It broke it broke just before we um, we we started recording. In fact, uh, the news has broken that the um, housing communities and local government. So, sorry, the Leveling Up Secretary. They uh -huh. renamed it. Michael Gove has rejected the uh, planning application for what has been called the foster tulip. Mm -hmm. um, well, at least that's one of the kind of things it's been called. It is this colossally expensive, um, colossally tall, only a few metres short from the shard. You might say that I couldn't possibly comment. I mean, <laughs> the, the, it, the, so, so, some, of, some of the names uh, that it has been called are not fit for a podcast that's going out before the watershed. Uh -huh. um, but Michael Gove has turned down the application on two grounds, one of which is embodied carbon, and the uh, because the, the amount of carbon the project would um, generate for uh, uh, for absolutely really no point whatsoever. Which actually ties um, in with uh, something we were talking about a couple of watching briefs ago in terms of um, uh, the, uh, architects and other bodies trying to move towards yeah. more carbon neutral building. Absolutely, yeah, that, 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 that's absolutely, a yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah, it's, the it's a very no, it, it, you know, we're, we're always happy to bash the government, but also we have to be give the government credit where it's due, and credit is due to Michael Gove here, I think, mm -hmm. for, for for rejecting what was an absolutely ridiculous planning application. Yeah. So carbon um, and carbon and get this heritage grounds Ooh. um the 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 um it would have had a, a a very intrusive visual impact on the tower of london world heritage site right and it was Ooh. opposed quite vehemently by historic england is this is, uh, is this is this the government learning a lesson from liverpool it is certainly possible and UNESCO it is certainly possible. Yeah, rescinding that status from the, now, from the hmm. absolutely now the, the question i would leave our viewer with is can you think of another World Heritage Site in England where a massively carbon um, positive uh, rather than carbon neutral project, construction project, is taking place within and across a World Heritage Site? Oh, uh, I don't know. I'd... Uh, I, it's hard there, to say. There's, there, 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 there's one I can think of which was recently found to have been unlawful. Oh, I see. And I, <laughs> and I, I think, I think um, Michael Gove and the government may find this precedent being quoted back at them in future. 
They may indeed. They may indeed. Well, I, I found I have found my positive story. Uh, this is um, uh, just just triple checking the uh, the location. Yes, cool. Okay, great. So this is the story of uh, a a ring, a ring which has been discovered according to CNN. Um, in is it uh, one ring to bind them all? It's not. It's not. It's wrong. One ring to to maybe rebind your head after a hard night's drinking. Uh, this is a ring that's been found in uh, in Israel, um, excavated in uh, the city of Yavne, or Yavni, uh, and it's it's a ring that has a jewel in it, an amethyst, um, that uh, had various virtues attached to the gem. Uh, it includes, uh, for example, the prevention of the side effects of drinking, known as the hangover the ring was found just 150 meters or 492 feet away from the remains of a warehouse containing the amphora uh, that stored a great many <laughs> great many liters of wine and the excavation so field test were they were they field testing <laughs> they, they field testing the ring exactly uh, the excavation site has been <laughs> dated to approximately the seventh century around the end of the, the byzantine era uh, and the start of the early Islamic period, uh, though officials said the ring could be even older. Gold rings inlaid with amethyst stone are known in the Roman world, um, said the press release, and it is possible that the ring's find uh, discovery belongs to elites who lived in the city as early as the 3rd century uh, uh, AD, or Common Era. So there you go. Yeah, that's, that's a nice little little story. A ring to, to stave off the effect of a hangover. I, I, I hate to uh, I hate to impose a sense of reality on this, but uh, in in my experience, and there are many many alleged cures for hangovers, and they never work. Oh. I think I think whoever bought that ring was had. You see, you, you just had you just had to do it, and you just have to bring bring us back down. Look, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm very I'm, look. <laughs> Uh, look, I'm very happy to experiment and see whether it works. Yeah. So, I mean, if they'll let us have, you know, borrow it or yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. make a, a copy, I, I'm 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 very happy to see whether it see whether it works. Yeah. With the party seasons coming up, plenty yeah, yeah. of opportunities to uh, to give it. Well, a go. apparently, apparently, we've, we're going to have plenty of beer this year in the UK, but very few turkeys. So. There we go. This this will help us with that. Um, iron brew as well. I've heard people say and, that iron and, brew. And apparently. It's a good hangover. We've even had Alexandra Casio Cortez, um, the, 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 uh, the AOC, the American, uh, famous American senator, tweeting from COP26 that she managed to found up, find Iron Brew and she loved it. Excellent. Although, although, and so we really are going off a ta- on a tangent here, but although we are, it should be said that Iron Brew. Um, it was recently, or not that recently, actually, a few years ago now, it was altered so that it doesn't have as much sugar. And Mrs. Soup is not happy. So so whenever we can, we get the original 1908 recipe iron brew uh, that comes in glass bottles. Uh, but anyway, sorry, that has <laughs> nothing to do with anything. <laughs> It's not good. No, no, we are, we are, de- we are dealing with his, we, we are, we, we, material culture and historical the, the I, I, of history of food. I thought you were going to say the hysteria of uh, of going slowly mad. Uh, but, but anyway, that's as well. It has been. It has been an interesting week um, for various reasons. Thank you guys for watching and for listening. Uh, next week, is there any clue we can have as to what's coming next week, or is this another one of those ones where where we can't? Uh, I think because there's still uh, things happening and comments still being sorted and so on, I think we uh, we need to uh, sit on it just for a little while. Okay. Watch well, this space is all I can say. Watch this space indeed. Thank you guys. As I say, um, do comment below. Do let us know what your experience at the moment at university is. If you if you feel as though you have a, a story that you, that you want to share, and if you if you want to share something confidentially please do reach out to us uh obviously andy's dms are open on twitter and uh, there's an email link just below that we all we always keep an eye on as well uh yeah thank you until next time do take care bye-bye bye-bye